Uh, so Martin, tell us why you're not too concerned here. Well, um, I think the, the main reason why I'm not too concerned is that China's economy is just, you know, so incredibly strong. I mean, first of all, you know, many people aren't even aware that in purchasing power parity terms, China, China had already overtaken the U.S. as number one economy in the world in 2014. But fast forward to today, I think the COVID crisis somehow and uh, not just accelerated, you know, a move towards technology globally, but also accelerated a further rise of China. We have seen the exports really, really strong. Um, you know, all, all other numbers coming strong tomorrow. You know, we see the GDP uh, figures. And China, you know, has the luxury uh, to use this strength to reduce debt risk and, and bubble risk in the economy. And it has been doing that even already last year. We have seen higher defaults of state-owned enterprises uh, than before, and it's just basically a tidy-up exercise. I don't think, though, that you know, if there was anything more systemic stemming from this, um, that you know, that there wouldn't be uh, in intervening. They definitely have the ammunition um, to do so, and I think it's a good process. They're just letting market forces be more determinant of of default of companies there. And Martin, more broadly, is the market focus, in your view, on the global recovery and not on concerns like rising inflation or slow vaccine rollouts? Well, I think the inflation question is is possibly the most underestimated risk of all out there right now. I mean, we have seen the U.S. administration, we have seen um, Jerome Powell talking a lot about inflation being just transitory and not really a problem, etc. He has a big toolbox, if anything was getting more out of hand. Yesterday night, we actually saw the um, export-import prices uh, come in in the U.S. On, on the heels of the quite high CPI the previous day. And ex uh, import prices jumped 6.9% year-on-year, export prices 9.1% uh, 9 year-on-year. That's at a decade high. Um, so you have high inflation within the U.S. You have China no longer being able to help keeping um, inflation in, across the globe low uh, by exporting deflation. That's really coming to an end because they have the local price pressures too. Then you have massive, massive budget deficits. Now, some of the recent figures like the uh, 1.7 trillion so far this fiscal year, 3.1 last year. Now, that's related to COVID. But even before that, you have one, you have had 1 trillion annual deficits. And that alone, arguably, was already before building inflationary pressure. So I think it's going to be very tricky for the Fed, for the government to communicate and to, to take out that toolbox because debt is so high um, that any substantial increase in rates to stop inflation might just risk running into a, a, a debt crisis. I strongly recommend um, that people might want to read a report by the Congressional Budget Office 2021 long-term budget outlook on this to, for further insights. It makes for quite chilling reading. Yeah, probably also not a good idea to read, um, or perhaps read Adam Smith as well with this. Uh, Martin, so, I mean, what you're suggesting here is, and you know, we've got a lot of pent up demand in the system. And of course, as we come out of the coronavirus pandemic, we'll see some of that come to fruition. So we'd have not just cost push inflation, we'd have demand pull inflation as well. So with those two working in tandem, it can elevate inflation to a new level, can it not? And how would you know if it's going to be transient? Uh, at all? Well, I think, you know, you have a lot of people talking about, oh, there's disruption in the supply chain. There's shortage of, shortage of semiconductors. There's bad weather. There's lumber prices rising because, you know, not, not enough uh, uh, lumber being available right now or labor shortages and this and that. But if you see signs popping up that really everywhere all across the board, you know, you really have to question um, if, if it's maybe something that's, that's you know, not just related to um, specific factors, but just related to, um, you know, potential devaluation of currency, partly as a result of um, the, 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 the stimulus measures that we have seen, partly as a result of monetary policy um, that happened before. And I think for investors, um, you know, one particular practical piece of advice I would give um, some people in the marketplace have been suggesting to leverage up on bond or bond fund investors investments so that 
um, you know, higher yield can be achieved in this low interest rate environment. But if there's any unforeseen um, stronger inflation coming through, potentially along with more talk about uh, interest rates uh, hikes happening at some point and, and the debt crisis, we might see quite high volatility on this. So leveraging bond investments is something I'd strongly not be recommending. Tell me here also, Martin, I mean, we'll return back to economics and the macro economy. But you're at the moment warning about these uh, special purpose acquisition companies. You're suggesting at the moment that they do, uh, the boom at least in them, represents a, a warning sign. Tell us why. Well, I would say that the run to technology in the first instance sort of accelerated with the uh, COVID uh, crisis. And then it led to an IPO boom and, and those sectors of biotech, healthcare, technology generally, and new energy becoming really popular. And I think SPACs is a bit of an outgrowth um, of this. So first of all, due diligence and valuations is something that I, I doubt it's being as carefully looked at as it probably should. And perhaps more importantly, with the majority, the vast majority of current SPACs that are out there, there's a massive conflict of interest that's inherent uh, in this structure, whereby particularly those secondary investors uh, and those uh, intending to hold the company post-merger are shouldering a lot of the cost, which often gets amplified as the initial investors uh, leave. They're facing a lot of dilution and conflict of interest between the sponsors and them. So I would be very extremely careful for, um, I also uh, recommend um, to look for anyone interested in this subject in more, in more depth. This study is sober look at SPACs that really points out in more detail those kind of issues. Uh, on this note, though, very briefly, the proposals that I've seen so far coming from the Singapore uh, government, uh, looking at their SPAC regime, actually some of those things that they are proposing to change for the benefit of investor protection are actually quite, uh, uh, quite positive. The only question is then, you know, will, um, will, will SPACs be taking off? They are not. But I think uh, putting investors um, right and putting, uh, uh, making a fair marketplace, assuring this is, is of the utmost importance and corners shouldn't be cut there. So, Martin, quite a few risks that you've pointed to there, including inflation, including SPACs. And we're also looking at the crackdown here on a number of China big companies. Talk us through, though, your very bullish call on uh, what we're expecting to see from China growth. Well, I start off as a brief warning, um, you know, while I'm generally really optimistic on, on China's economy, you know, partly also helped by, by some of these trade agreements. I mean, we all have heard of RCEP late last year as well as the euro, um, you know, investment uh, deal. And I think those will, the benefits will only come through uh, after some time. Um, but the economy doesn't necessarily uh, mean the same will uh, happen in markets. So I think in markets, I would highlight two particular risks. One, property prices uh, are actually um, relatively high. The other thing is anything to do with new economy, particular uh, new energy sector has been really getting quite uh, pricey. In fact, you might be aware the star market has looked at tightening uh, rules quite opposite to what has been happening with SPACs in the US against this backdrop. So if for anyone invested very highly in new energy, high growth areas, some rotation to value and, and, and of course global diversification is what I would suggest. Um, very quickly here, uh, Martin, on that GDP print we're getting out of China, what are you looking for in particular as you delve into the detail of it? Because we're looking at a stellar figure, of course, which is somewhat, uh, uh, somewhat flattered, flattered by base, base effects. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, you know, there's diff there are different predictions out there, some of them as high as 20% for this quarter year on year. But you're absolutely right. They, they are very, very distorted given what happened last year uh, in the same quarter. Uh, moreover, China is really looking now more at quality, reducing the leverage and debt risk because they have the luxury really to do it against this uh, strength. So um, definitely, um, you know, I, I, I think um, China is doing extremely well, though, uh, and, and investors have opportunities there if they avoid those that are most pricey.